So why are we doing home churches? I guess that's the big question. What's taken us from the way that we were, the wineskin, the structures, the methodology of living out our faith into a new wineskin, a new methodology, a new way of doing what we're doing? I guess one of the turning points for us, and I'll probably give a little disclaimer up front. We're on a journey. This journey could take two to five years. We're learning and growing as we go on this journey. It's not that we've arrived. It's not that we've sold into or bought into a new model. We didn't read this in some textbook or somebody's idea. It really came from the Lord uh, challenging us that his church is not fit for purpose. He gave us a great commission. And, and we don't really evaluate ourselves against either the Great Commission or the Great Commandment. Uh, for many people in church, the evaluation of how they're doing may be centered around the church they go to. Is this church a nice church? Do I like it? Do I like the building? Is it warm? Is it nice? Are there good friends there? What's their children's work like? What's their worship like? Uh, what's the pastor like? What's his preaching like? And whether we voice them, and I think there, these, these things are often voiced, or whether we think about them in our thoughts and then make decisions, it's interesting, all of those kind of questions are thinking like consumers. What do I want? How does it suit me? How does it suit my family? Does it work for my kind of Christianity? And then we decide whether we're in or out or whether we've been in for a while and now we're out because we quite don't like that way of doing it. We want to do it this way and that place over there does this or this person offended me. I think one of the really big challenges for us as followers of Christ um, not intentionally, but we have started to think like consumers whose needs must be met instead of followers of Christ who are looking to the needs of Christ, his commands, what he's asking from us. And I think on this journey, it started with the Lord really saying the church isn't fit for purpose in its current state. And so the challenge to us that it's been too platform oriented it's been too personality driven. Uh, it's too centered around a Sunday as the key time and the key way to express our Christianity. And then it's become too consumer focused. Uh, what do the people want? What would the people like? We couldn't possibly do that because people may not like that. And I think some of our way of thinking has not been helpful in terms of when we read the New Testament and what the Lord is asking from us. Let me take us to Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, a a well-known passage, uh, an important passage, sometimes pulled out to get everybody to go witness to other people. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great weekend, it's Easter. Don't forget to go tell people about Jesus, or you should be. And we can feel a guilt trip. I'm not really wired that way. I shouldn't really be doing evangelism. But I want to suggest to you that this passage is not just about sharing my faith with somebody else. It's at the core of the way disciples live. Disciples are disciples of Christ. These are people, these ones here in the New Testament and us today should be ones who are following Jesus, looking to him. And then as we have committed and surrendered our lives to him, we now become disciples of other people. And the command of our Savior before he exited the earth, the ascension took place and he's at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for us. He's praying for us. I believe he's praying that we would do this and we would do this well and that every hindrance to being a disciple of his and being a disciple maker, um, every hindrance would be removed out of the way. The command of Jesus here is he has all authority, he gives authority to us, and he commands us to go make disciples of all nations. That, that's massively inconvenient. Uh, it's like, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. I wanted to attend church. I want to make sure I'm on my way to heaven. I want to make sure you meet my needs, Lord, my family's needs. I want my kids to grow up morally well-behaved, uh, hopefully following Jesus themselves. I'm generalizing uh, but I do believe that this has been the, the, the larger majority of Christians have been living this way. 
And the Lord has been saying, it can't be that way anymore. I want to bring, and he's, he's, he's really shaking us awake and taking us back to the way that things used to be. So why home church? Because we have not been making disciples and we have not been involved in church planting the way that the Lord Jesus commanded us to do. Many Christians will live and die and never lead anybody to Christ. They will never pour their lives into somebody else and help them to become a follower of Christ, wrestle with the teaching of Christ and the truth of Christ and walk alongside them. I think that's an extremely sad indictment on the church today. For all of those reasons and perhaps many more, I think the piece of revival plays into it. Look at that in just a moment, harvest coming in. But the Lord is shaking up his, his family, shaking up his bride, shaking up his body and saying it's time to understand what it means to be a follower of Christ and obeying Christ's commission that all of us are disciples and all of us should be disciple making. I think the bigger story of narrative of, sorry, the bigger narrative of revival is really important. Let me read to you Acts 2, 42 to 47. They, this is the 3,000 that have just become saved. They have been baptized in water. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There's, there's a clear, um, following Christ, a clear way that this pervades all of their lives. The mealtimes, their homes, their friendships, their relationships, their commitment to the teaching given by the apostles, the commitment to prayer, to breaking bread. And I don't get the impression it was just relegated to a building where a few people officiated these things to happen and we went there once a week to do it. Instead, it's like this body is mobilized and they become the catalyst. And as you read the next few chapters, the church grows again uh, by thousands and again by thousands. And persecution hits and they spread through the then known world, taking the good news of Jesus with them. This is a whole life discipleship. It spills into every day of the week. It spills into every moment of the day that we are now radical followers of Jesus. Not that we have a nice Western lifestyle or wherever we may live, and then a part of that is this Christian thing I do. But actually Jesus comes in as Lord and takes over everything. And because of our love and our devotion to him, we give him everything and we say, we're in. Whatever you want, however you ask for it, we are wholeheartedly in. And I think the way that, uh, that, the reason that's important and the way revival fits into it, we have a firm conviction that the breath of the Holy Spirit has begun blowing throughout the world, throughout our land. Um, what we have seen in history, we see, we've seen it in the Old Testament, we see in the New Testament moments and times where the breath of the Spirit blows and large numbers of people become aware of eternal issues and they surrender their lives to Christ. They turn their hearts towards the Lord. It's happened throughout history in every century. We call it a revival, a move of God. It's just eternity becomes far more tangible, real. Men and women and children are aware of their need of God. Well, we're convinced we are due one of those moves of God again. And the church in its current form would not be able to handle the amount of harvest that's coming. Too many people have been passive. We've had a few people working and a lot of people observing. And God is saying, I need everybody praying. I need everybody uh, pouring their lives into others. In fact, I need everybody to be a disciple. The word disciples cover, covers everything. Devoted to Christ, reproducing our lives as Christ followers in the lives of other people. 
And so I believe that there's a shakeup that God is doing to help us get ready for what is coming. Home churches, because we've not been fit for purpose. Home churches, because of the harvest that's coming. And we're all going to be needed, every hand on deck, to do what God is calling us to do. That may lead me to my final question in the final section of this uh, first session. It just simply to say, what do we mean by home church? And uh, we're still wrestling this through as well as a team and thinking, how does this work? What does it look like? Uh, you know, Acts 4 paints a picture. Acts 2, the passage I read, paints one here. In Acts 4, it says all the believers, verse 32, were one in heart and mind. That's a Holy Spirit relationship, a Holy Spirit joining. We're asking the Lord to do that again. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. That's a powerful a uh, unity, a powerful sense of sharing, uh, a commonality between them. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and laid it at the apostles' feet. I think it shows us a place for family. It shows us a place where there's growth. It shows us there's a place for care, no needy persons among them. Everybody's sharing life. Everybody's involved in mission. And there's these gatherings in smaller spaces in their homes that are taking place. And I'm aware we will, the majority will be in homes, but there may be some in coffee shops or community centers. The, the idea isn't just everybody has to be in a home. The idea is these are smaller gatherings, leg legitimate churches. It's where mission happens. It's where discipleship happens. It's where care happens. And, and those smaller gatherings also reproducing. We are leading others to Christ as they come in. And then before we know it, it, our gathering is too big and we need to grow again and multiply and become two gatherings. And then the two become four and the four become eight and so on. I believe it will be a work of the Holy Spirit. It's saying everybody's responsible in terms of caring for each other. We're opening up our lives. We're opening up our homes. That's a big ask in the Western uh, world. Our homes have become like our castles. We don't want people in there. I know some do. Uh, but one of the arguments I've hit again and again is people won't open up their homes. And, and some of the reason is people are private. I understand that. Some of it is their Christianity doesn't pervade their home. And so they're nervous about having people come in and watch the way that their marriage is, watch the way that their parenting is. This is where a whole life discipleship is critical for what we're sharing now to work. The Lord has to take everything me in me. He has to be involved in my marriage with Esther, in my conversations with our children. His presence has to pervade our meal times. Uh, when there's conflict and we need resolution, his presence has to pervade that. And so as it begins in the home, as it starts in the essence of who we are, it spills out. My hope is that this becomes organic wherever you are in the UK. And uh, whichever one of our families you belong to, the movement is one big family, uh, but within there we recognize there's families. Uh, I really believe that as we trust the Lord and look to him, he'll show us how to have these holy places in our homes gathered around with other people. <laughs> 